All right. Uh, um, so welcome to the guest lecture on how to build your own DARPA grade hypervisor. Yep. Uh, Jacob Tori. It's my pleasure to introduce Jacob. Uh, we met at the DARPA CyberFast Track uh, conference where Jacob was presenting his work on uh, a security hypervisor for Windows. And so I thought it would be a great idea for him to uh, come and tell us about the designer's view of a hypervisor in an actual uh, production operating system. And so with that, okay. I have to take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Jacob Torrey, I work for AIS uh, doing computer security research um, for DARPA, Air Force, uh, whoever. Uh, and um, I lead the computer architectures group. So we look at look for discrepancies between hardware specifications and hardware realities uh, and try to find interesting ways to misuse the system. <coughs> uh, so real quick about virtualization, I'm sure you're all very familiar with it, but uh, Intel, ARM, AMD, they provided hardware extensions to the their, their architectures uh, to allow virtualization of a unmodified operating system on a single physical machine. Uh, this kind of was driven by a lot of market interest in Xen and VMware, which were originally doing para virtualization or dynamic binary translation. Uh, and then they kind of saw this big market need and exploded into the cloud, which is the most overused term, I think, in computing right now. So. Uh, my goal is to try to get you guys from knowing how to build an operating system, which I'm hoping you guys know how to do, to the nuts and bolts to build your own hypervisor, and then some things more interestingly on top of that for how you can use that to further your research goals and uh, kind of go from there. And then I will talk about uh, a few other uh, research efforts that I've done and then some other people in the field that are doing that I think kind of expose certain uh, irregularities. Uh, the slides will all be emailed out, so um, don't worry about taking notes and don't hesitate to jump in with questions if I'm not sure exactly what you guys have all learned. So if I make some assumptions or if I'm talking about something you all know, just tell me to go ahead. Uh, full versus para virtualization. Uh, we're going to focus on full virtualization. So the guest OS is unmodified uh, and it's running um, it, it thinks it's running without virtualization for the most part. There are some detection routines, which I'll talk about, um, but mostly when you run Windows in a full virtualized environment, it thinks it's running on the native hardware. Uh, pair of virtualization being where they've made some modifications to the guest OS to simplify the hypervisor requirements. Disk I.O., network I.O., it's much easier if you know there's a hypervisor there and you talk directly to that rather than having the hypervisor emulate all the hardware interactions. Um, and so PV drivers, pair virtualization drivers, are still used, uh, mostly for speed and performance and to get more oomph out of a, say, a resource constrained system. So VTX is what enables full virtualization uh, and it's much more interesting. So we're going to talk about kind of the, the gap between OS and, and a VMM, which is a virtual machine monitor, uh, and kind of the similarities and how you can think of it, what a hypervisor is from an OS developer's concept, and then some technical overview about not necessarily exact specifics about how to build one, but enough to get you started, um, and at least knowing what to, to Google for or what to search the Intel software development manuals for. Uh, or at least the right questions to ask. A couple of sides into uh, Intel Trusted Execution Technology and System Management Mode, which are uh, always popular at uh, DEF CON and Black Hat. Some interesting research out there, um, including more, which was uh, the, the DARPA project I worked on for Mudge. And then uh, some future work ideas, just some random things I kind of came up with pretty quickly. And then go from there to concluding remarks and questions. Um, so you can think of a VMM as a kernel that's running applications which are all operating systems. So it's uh, more privileged on the system than each kernel is. Uh, you can do all the same things you can do with a kernel. You can abstract memory. Uh, each OS has what's known as guest physical addresses, 
which are then translated with very similar what's called extended page tables. So you have the same, same paging structures, which then translate from guest physical to machine physical addresses. You can multiplex, multiplex between different operating systems. You can trap on whatever conditions you want. Uh, certain things always trap to the hypervisor, but many of them you can just have the operating system manage on its own. And then you can provide whatever consistent or abstract view of hardware. So much like paging in virtual memory allows you to give every 32-bit application a 4 gig flat memory address where it assumes it has all 4 gigabytes to itself when there might not even be 4 gigabytes of memory on the system. Hypervisors can do the exact same thing to an operating system where they all think they're running with contiguous memory. Yeah. So uh, to put this in context of the code that we've read in class okay. for uh, virtual memory translation, uh, we have the CR3 register. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it points to a set of page tables. Um, right? Yes, exactly. So how would the uh, virtual physical addresses sure. fit into that? All right, so this is um, what you see in your normal You've probably actually seen this picture. It's if you search for paging, that's like the first link on Google. Uh, so yeah, you have your CR3 register. And each guest has its own CR3 register, which is stored in the, uh, the VMCS, which I'll talk about. It's a kind of control, control structure. It's almost like a task struct or a, a task state segment, TSS, if you're doing hardware multitasking. Um, and so you have actually a very similar method where you have a pointer, an EPTP, EPTPTR, extended page table pointer. How are we going to do it on the markers? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's, it's based off of 64-bit. So you have uh, the PML4. Um, so you have essentially uh, a pointer, or you have a register in the CPU, which is your just like a CR3. And that points to uh, this. It's if this right here is set to big pages, this right here will map in, identity map, 512 gigabytes of memory. So you can have, I think, up to four of these. Uh, and then you can go from that into a page directory, an EPT page directory, and then uh, down to a page table entry. So. Uh, it's very, very simple. Essentially, you're setting up the same structure that treats a guest physical address coming in from this side, and then uh, you're outputting, essentially, a uh, machine physical. So you're adding another layer of translation yep. uh, in front of the segment translation and in, fr in front of the, and, you know, uh, the uh, virtual memory translation. Yep. So there are three of them now. Yeah, I think if you just look at, if you ignore segmentation and you look at just, you can have up to, I think, seven levels of lookup tables that different parts of the address, so your, you know, different bits of your virtual address become different bits of the, the guest physical address. Mm -hmm. And then you can have another four level walk down or three level walk on top of that to get your final machine physical <coughs> address. Uh, EPT, extended page tables, is a relatively new technology and it replaced a lot of, uh, very hackish thing. You used to have to write a virtual TLB, translation look aside buffer, uh, in order to do um, memo memory shadowing. And that was pretty difficult and challenging. So uh, they came out with EPT, uh, which really simplified it. And it's the same model that you guys have already been using. Uh, it's just slightly different pointers and slightly different fields. Uh, for example, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, one of the benefits is the permissions are much more granular in EPT. So you can set uh, a region of memory to be execute only, read only, or write only, or any combination of that three. Um, and so at the very end when I talk about my research, that's actually one of the kind of crucial uh, building blocks. Um, my personal opinion is VTX is actually pretty good. Uh, they removed a lot of cruft, I think, that they had. Um, you're familiar with the multiple rings in a system, and then their system management mode. Uh, 
Uh, and in most CPUs these days actually emulate everything running in real mode uh, on the, the microwatt risk core of an x86 processor. So there's a lot of levels of complication which they kind of said, okay, well, looking back at these many years of security problems and annoying backward support, let's try to just cut it out and make it as simple as possible. And so uh, originally there was no support for real mode. You had to start in protected mode or emulate your way there. 64-bit um, away, you don't need the horrible atrocity that is physical address extensions. Uh, and your VMM can be quite small. Uh, in fact, one of the last things I'm going to talk about is a paper called No Hype, in which you don't have a hypervisor, but you're running guests. So that's about as small as you can get for a trusted code base. Um, so really quickly, from your, your normal kernel, so over here you'd have your standard uh, kernel stack, you know, ring 0 through 3. Uh, some people like to talk about the um, VMX root mode or where the VMM is running as ring minus one, um, just to, to kind of keep it in that, that way to talk about it. And then you have, you run the VMX on command from kernel mode, uh, and then you can set up your, your different guests and they can exit and enter depending on how you have everything set up. Um, this picture and the, all, a lot of the information is in the Intel uh, manuals 3C. Um, in which it has that entire volume is just about uh, virtualization. So it's a pretty interesting read if you're looking for something to put you to sleep. No, just kidding. Um, what's interesting here is uh, all you need is kernel privileges to run the VMX on command, and there doesn't need to be an apparent or obvious change to the system. So. There was a paper uh, in Black Hat called uh, Blue Pill, which was a thin hypervisor that most every computer out there has virtualization extensions. I mean, I see a lot of Macs. Pretty sure they all have it um, by default, but not everyone runs a hypervisor all the time. And so this was a rootkit, which would put itself there. And then it could use all of these things that I'm going to talk about, all these tools, to hide itself from antivirus or even people out looking there. So um, then there's a couple of papers kind of going back and forth about is there a way you can even detect if you're running in a hypervisor? Um, Intel hasn't put out a very clear way to do that, probably because they're worried that Microsoft would then make you pay extra to run virtual uh, Windows environments. But uh, that's my personal hypothesis. Of course, that was called a red pill. Red pill, yeah. And then there was no pill. And then there was a few other ones, uh, which I can get into the technical details of that if you're interested. Perhaps we should uh, explain the uh, red pill, blue pill. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, well, the <laughs> matrix, right? Which pill would you like? You know, the red pill or the blue pill? Right? The red pill is for seeing things as they are. The blue pill is for staying in your comfortable, uh, emulated world. Uh, John Rutkowska, the uh, researcher who put out yep. who invisible coined things the term, lab. Yeah. yes, invisible things lab, uh, she put out the first, the, she coined the term the red pill. And then, of course, you had to follow up with the blue pill. <laughs> uh, so the general architecture, you have root and non-root mode. So rather than having you know, your four rings of privilege, which in most operating systems, only two of them are used. I think Minix, their kernel modules run in ring one, but that's a little bit of normal. Um, and then you use you know, these instructions, VM on, VMX off, and then your exit and enters, which switch between the two modes. Uh, you can either initiate this from kernel mode or SMM, system management mode, which is also called ring minus two. Um, so I'll talk about it a little bit later. You can actually run two hypervisors on the same CPU at the same time in what's known as dual monitor mode or uh, software, sorry, system management mode transfer monitor. Um, and so system management mode I'll talk about a little bit later. It's a really fun space to play in uh, and it's... Um, quite powerful and also quite terrifying that Intel built essentially a stealth rootkit platform that they put in all of their CPUs without telling anyone. Uh, so each VMM sets up uh, a task struct-like um, VM control structure. Uh, it's called a VMCS. Uh, it's not exactly like a task struct. It's more like a, a TSS for hardware multitasking. I'm not sure if you covered that. 
Um, not in depth. Uh, so it's uh, TSS, uh, as you remember, holds the uh, stack pointers for the different rings, as well as other registers, as well as a copy of CR3. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the VM on this VMCS is uh, it's a data structure that's used by the hardware, uh, whereas task struct is kind of more a logical thing built by you know either Linux or any of the other uh, kernels. Um, and so you can specify what events trigger VMX. It's, it's a place you can go and look up the guest state. So if it traps to you for, say, a page fault, you can see what kind of code it was executing. Was it a data or an instruction request? Uh, and you can kind of go from there. So in a sense, you might say it combines uh, the features of debug registers. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's TSS. Mm -hmm. As in debug registers, you can set combinations of bits that cause a trap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's even more specific than that. You can. Uh, I have a whole slide on VMXs and the kind of the neat things you can set up there. So I'll delay until that. Uh, and then, as we talked about for blue pill and red pill, uh, some events always trigger a uh, VM exit. The CPU and ID instruction is a very uh, common example of that. Um, sometimes when you run a, a virtual environment and you do a CPU ID, it will say genuine Intel Zen core or something like that, rather than whatever kind of processor you have. Uh, blue pill obviously would return the real CPU, so you wouldn't see that. Um, and this is one way you can determine if an operating system is being maliciously virtualized, or if you haven't installed, say, Zen or a uh, virtual box or something on there, and you notice some of these things, then that's a good clue that someone has, has pwned your box. Uh, and that's either by timing or by uh, cache influence. So timing, the CPU ID instruction should take generally no more than seven clock cycles for the basic, just return the string. Uh, if it starts taking hundreds of cycles, because it has to do a context switch, save all the registers, switch into VMX mode, uh, possibly flushing all the TLB entries just for them to put that string into the guest register and then have everything restored. If you run this multiple, multiple times, you can start to see that. Also, your cache influence is going to be changed quite a bit. So if you do a, a cache walk, like the MIT AAS attack, to look to see which regions of memory have been accessed in between two memory barriers, uh, you notice a pretty large difference. Um, we actually had a, one of my coworkers just did his dissertation on that specifically. He can detect system management mode, kernel mode, and VMX mode rootkits from user space uh, on a multi-core environment just by measuring the cache influence. And then he did some machine learning on that to automate it. Um, so Intel provides some protection from rogue guests uh, and some guests benefit from isolation uh, from each other. Uh, though I'd like to say that I think Intel's main motivators were performance and cost, not necessarily security. Uh, some of the mainframe operating systems, ZVM, uh, they do things quite a bit more securely, but it's also hundreds of thousands of dollars of hardware rather than a hundred dollar processor. Uh, and it couples really nicely with other Intel technologies. Uh, VTD, or uh, Virtualization Technologies for Directed I.O., allows you to do the same kind of work that a MMU does when you're doing these page translations to kind of prevent an application from writing to, say, the kernel space. You can do the same thing, but with DMA from devices. So if you had a malicious device or you had one guest, one of the earlier attacks, excuse me, uh, had one guest tell the hardware to DMA memory over the hypervisor. And so it overwrote uh, part of the Zen hypervisor, and then they were able to break out. So VTD is uh, the new technology that provides. It's called an IO MMU. Uh, TXT allows you to do a, a measured launch of a hypervisor from any point. So you can be running Windows, and then you can click a button and then uh, launch into a, a dynamic root of trust that's measured by the TPM uh, and put in a special mode so that other CPUs are actually shut down and there's no DMA. So you have a pretty good tamper-proof and interrupt-proof uh, region. And then finally, EPT and VPID is a newer technology that all falls under this VTX that'll makes it much easier to do memory management and uh, cache separation and management. Is VTD being used? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Zen uses it by default because that was how they got broken. Mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah, now almost all 
um, every vPro system that comes out, and now I'm pretty sure every VTX system that comes out has VTD. But to say that like, VMware uses it? VMware, I'm not sure that they're not open source, but uh, Zen certainly does, and you can set up your uh, domains if you want to assign, say, one network card to one guest directly. Uh, you can actually lock it in so that it can only talk to the DMA buffers in that guest. And so perhaps we should mention that the DMA controller, ah, which okay. takes uh, memory from uh, whatever device you're interacting with, you're doing I/O to, and uh, copies that memory to uh, copies that those contents into your RAM uh, without the processor, the main processor, doing any sort of copying. So as you can imagine, such a thing has serious security implications. You can insert uh, a disk, you know, uh, and uh, have your operating system overwritten without your processor being uh, any the wiser. So you could uh, blow away your operating system that way. Uh, DMA controllers, that is to say you could use that when the DMA controllers were unsophisticated yeah. and did not uh, provide uh, proper protection. And also, when, uh, configure, when OSs were not wise to that attack and did not provide a proper configuration. So it used to be that you could uh, uh, totally take over a system by just the act of connecting uh, a device. Yeah, so uh, even it depends on the, d the device as well. So Firewire uh, was pretty popular for Apple, which allows the, doesn't enforce a device and host model. Uh, so USB, generally, if you plug a USB device in, it's the device, and you can read and write memory directly to that device, but not the other way around. Firewire, they negotiate. So if you, there was, a, for a while, an iPod modification that you could plug an iPod into a locked Apple computer on Firewire, it would say, oh, I'm the host and you're the device. Let me direct memory access to these regions of memory, and it would actually read your password out from your locked computer, print it out on the iPod screen, and then you could log into your system. Um, or someone else's system, probably. Uh, and so DMA came about. Uh, so if you look at how you talk to a hard drive directly, uh, the ATA spec uh, or even the AHCI spec, uh, a lot of it used to be port I.O. So you're sending um, bytes or words or D words at a time to the controller and then getting a response, which takes a considerable amount of time. I think we, uh, we tried that. We put the CPU into port I.O. mode and tried to boot Windows XP. It took about five hours uh, to load it because the CPU had to be there for every byte that was written off, read off the, the screen. Um, so then, of course, they came out with this DMA where you just port I.O. a little request saying, I want these blocks in this memory address. Now, if a guest has direct access to a hard drive or a device that can do this DMA, it'd say, write these bytes to the hard drive and now take these bytes and copy them over the hypervisor. Um, so that's what VTD protects against. VMM architecture, uh, so you might hear type 1 or type 2. Um, I've heard a lot of different topics about type 3 and type 0, which I think are just nitpicking. Uh, so a type 1, uh, right over here, you have your hardware, so that's your computer. And then your hypervisor is running directly on the bare metal. So this is a Zen or a uh, VMware ESX or Hyper-V. Uh, and then you have your guests all in here. Um, whereas a Type 2, which you probably use on your desktop, you have VirtualBox um, or VMware Player. You have your host operating system, which talks directly to the hardware. And uh, then you have your guests running on top of that. There's advantages to both. Um, and they lead to different hardware multiplexing models. If you're running a bare metal hypervisor, you know, one of the advantages is that it, it can be a smaller code base and it could be more secure because you're not trusting the implicit host operating system entirely. Uh, that being said, you don't want to put all the hardware drivers into the hypervisor. So they usually have what's called a um, control domain, DOM0 in, in Zen, which has all those hardware drivers and it's usually just a Linux VM. And that talks directly to the hardware. And then the hypervisor routes all I.O. requests or network requests through that control domain. A um, little bit more secure and isolated because there is no full operating system in the trusted computing base. Uh, newer Zens have what's called stub domains, where they can break it out even more. So you might have 
one VM which just talks to the hard drive, and then one that just talks to the network, and then one that can manage the hypervisor, DOM0, but doesn't even have a network address or a MAC address. So there's really no way to get to that one. And even if someone hacks your, your network uh, domain, they still can't uh, control the hypervisor from that, that region. Yeah, then of course there's the question of what manages all the bytes that are on those systems, such as patches them, updates mm -hmm. them, installs packages. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's, uh, from an architectural model it might be more secure from a user and an administrator's model, then now you have five OS's you're managing rather than one, which uh, we're just at the Air Force. And what they're more afraid of is configuration mistakes rather than a super elite hacker finding a zero day in a hypervisor and getting into it. Because more likely than not, their system administrators just don't know exactly what they're doing or they have too much stuff to do. And so they'd much rather just say, you know, find a way to simplify that or not logging everything, as people are drowning in logs of possibly suspicious things. Uh, yeah. Um, where does the control domain of fit in the previous um, image that you had? Uh, so one of these guests would be okay. your control domain. Um, though it's it's yeah, it runs there. Though it has usually direct bypass to the hard uh, the hardware. Yeah, someone has to do the translation between the little language that the device speaks and uh, your Unix API. Yeah, and someone did a lot of work writing all the device drivers for Linux, so we might as well use them. Uh, the Type 2 uses the hardware drivers of a host OS, so it runs just like an application. If it needs, say, a virtual disk, it can just f-open that. Um, and then uh, it runs just like an application on your host OS. It's kind of a, a strange application because it's running both in user space and then usually a kernel module to kind of set things up. But then it's also running in this super privileged, I'm more powerful than the entire operating system, yet I'm still, most of my code is running in user space. So it's kind of a, an interesting uh, spread right there. Um, so we talked about this. Uh, page translation, essentially, you know, this is kind of the, the simple model of just you're looking up with the, without any virtualization. Uh, so you have I'm talking about a, a number of memory requests, which you guys are very aware is much slower than cache, uh, or also you know pretty slow in general. And so you add an EPT to that, and you can have upwards of seven translations just to look up tables and to actually get one byte of memory. Uh, so kind of to solve this. Intel came out with the, the translation look aside buffer, the TLB, which caches these translations. Um, and I will talk about how that plays into hypervisors a little bit later. But um, essentially, it just has a cache and checks. Has this address already been resolved? If so, just pull it right out of cache. Otherwise, uh, I'll go through and walk, walk through everything. Yeah. Um, uh, Shadow Walker? or PAX exploited the fact that uh, the translation look aside buffer uh, is different for data accesses and for uh, code accesses. And if you decouple them, you could get different pages for the same address. Uh, and if you remember, we mentioned that. I mentioned that briefly. But um, there will be a, a set of papers to read after this lecture. That will be one of them. We kind of talked a lot about this already, but um, rather than having a page fault, which can still be handled by the operating system because you don't want your hypervisor to be involved in maybe paging out to a virtual disk, uh, it triggers an EPT fault, uh, which traps the hypervisor rather than the operating system. Uh, before, when you're implementing a shadow TLB, you had to trap on all page faults, figure out if it was a page fault that the operating system should handle or whether you should handle, and then re-inject it if possible or if needed. Uh, so this makes it much more clear. So most hypervisors don't trap on the page fault handler anymore. Uh, is that uh, an additional uh, entry into the uh, interrupt descriptor table? No, this is part of the VMCS, which I'll talk about, which has a list of exits. Um, so in, rather than having an IDT, you have uh, the VM exit uh, control list, which is part of your VMCS. Right, whereas the page fault uh, uh, handler resides in the IDT. Yes, though you can add uh, any interrupt 
any number interrupt, so I want int, I think it's what, 14 uh, is page fault or 13. Um, you can add that interrupt specifically to trap to the hypervisor as well. Um, so you are, uh, uh, the hardware allows you, and the VMCS data structure allows you to stack yep. interrupt handlers. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, and so then you can decide if you want to re-inject it so that it will go to the host or whether you can just kind of quash that interrupt, mark it as handle, and then uh, continue on. Or you can inject arbitrary interrupts into that operating system, making them appear like they came from hardware. Uh, and then the uh, VM process ID, VPID, it adds a, a word to um, each TLB line, which we talked about earlier. Um, so that kind of flow chart would then have it uh, per guest. Um, so older versions of VTX, whenever you would exit or switch to another guest, it would flush the TLB because you didn't want to have some, say, mapping that wasn't valid in your new guest. Or even worse, if you had a, a mapping that would point to some hypervisor code region and you switch back, uh, then you'd be able to use that TLB entry until it was cleared to access the hypervisor. Um, so they've added this so that you get a huge performance hit and it also enables a lot of the, the other stuff that we'll talk about a little bit later. The caching attack is uh, how these days you can get into system management mode, uh, which I can talk about a little bit later as well. All right, so uh, talked about the first bit. So you have uh, one VMCS pointer per processor. Um, it's kind of like your CR3 uh, or your TSS register. Um, it points to whichever VMCS is currently active or going to be active if you're in the hypervisor. Um, it stores the guest and the host state. Uh, exit conditions, say there's a bitmap of, for example, IO ports you want to trap on if you want to, say, emulate a hard drive. It'll uh, you know, grab those ATA ports, but it might let the debug port uh, or the keyboard controller port go directly out. Um, and then uh, it, other pointers to other structures, including you know, where you can find the uh, EPT, PT, PTR. Uh, and it's kind of a weird structure in that you can't directly access it um, from memory. You need to use a VM read, VM write kind of like a, an MSR, read MSR, and write MSR, um, machine-specific registers. Yeah, we've, uh, uh, we've mentioned that. Uh, OK. We've, I've mentioned that uh, this is how modern system calls are done. OK, perfect. Um, some of the things you can trap on. So as we talked about, we talked about interrupts. Um, any interrupt that the operating system can trap on, mm -hmm. the hypervisor can trap on, and then decide what it wants to do with it first. Uh, memory faults, uh, you can either trap on a page fault, a uh, general protection fault, or then any of these EPT. There are two types of EPT faults. There's a fault and a violation. One is like a page fault, and then one is more of a fault saying that something's been misconfigured in EPT, and it's more of a panic than a, hey, this memory access is, uh, is not allowed. Um, any IO access, you can either say all IO access, port IO access. <coughs> or these ports that I'm giving you, specifying. Uh, and then a whole bunch of privilege instructions. So moving to control registers. Uh, as you guys know, when you move to control register 3, it flushes the TLB because it's generally a process switch, um, except for global pages. And so if you want to be able to do something weird in memory or in the TLB, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that's uh, something you really got to be careful to make sure you trap on. Uh, and reading and writing to MSRs. This I found very interesting that the new Intel's hardware uh, random number generator, the hypervisor can, uh, can trap on that and return whatever value it'd like. Um, also, the hypervisor can trap on entries into the TXT mode. And there was some interesting work that showed that you could emulate the, uh, the Intel signed SINIT module to basically trick a guest into thinking that TXT had run even though it hadn't. Yeah, this is interesting because, of course, uh, what you uh, want uh, in the system you really, really want to trust is uh, first you want a signed uh, BIOS that uh, loads that, that you are sure has not been modified, right? Then from that you go into your bootloader. Again, you want to check that. Your BIOS must help you to check that. Uh, then, of course, you need to check your operating system. 
That way you build up the chain of trust. So it used to be that you use this a passive a crypto provider, this chip uh, called a, a TPM, Trusted Platform Module. Um, it was pretty cheap. You know, your iPhones uh, used to have that, probably still do. Um, I think they're, they're going everywhere. So yeah. if it doesn't have one, it will soon. So uh, if you are, uh, when you're loading up your entire succession of environments, uh, ending with your operating system and your application stack, well, uh, you want to make sure that uh, none of that, uh, none of the links in that chain has been interfered with. And what uh, TXT added to that was uh, yet another environment on the processor, which is richer than the TPM, which is basically uh, a very limited chip for storing, checking, making signatures. Um, and now, of course, uh, a rootkit can pretend Yep. that uh, the TXT has run and uh, uh, can leave you with uh, well, false sense of security. Yes, exactly. So yeah, there's uh, static root of trust, which is what you talked about where you have your BIOS, which then measures, you have a very, very small part of the BIOS, which all it does is it measures big BIOS and extends the TPM. So the TPM has called platform configuration registers. They're extend only, so they start out at either minus one or zero. And then when you write to them, it takes the hash that you're writing to it, it concatenates that with the current value, and then hashes that again. And so it updates so that you can't rewrite it with something. You can't go back and you know, revisionist history, for example. Um, the only way to do that is to enter TXT, which will reset certain PCR values uh, back to um, their original state. Um, the problem with that is that there's a lot of stuff in the boot process which may or may not be under the auspices of the BIOS manufacturing. There's a lot of chipset code. So what gets put into sits in management mode, there's an a ACPI handler, there's APM is the old uh, power management for Linux, uh, which basically you would say, turn the fan on, and then you would trigger an SMI, system management mode interrupt. All that code is running and kind of locked out. And then there's option ROMs, which are being run on your graphics card, your network card, even possibly a RAID card. Uh, which might not agree with the, the measurements. And so you, as soon as you have a single piece that doesn't measure the next piece before executing it, your chain of trust is broken. So what TXT allows you to do is run all that, and your system can be completely hosed. And then you click this button, and then your system will load a hypervisor or an operating system without relying on the previous BIOS. Um, the only way to verify that is what's called remote attestation, which is proving to another computer, another server, that yes, I have actually run TXT, and yes, these are my measurements. And so you can tie that into, say, VPN access. So you'd not be able to connect a hacked laptop to Dartmouth yeah. network. Well, so the theory went. So yeah, uh, that never actually came into existence, but that's what people like yeah. to talk about. Yeah, imagine the huge variety of all the different pieces of code that occur all across the trusted models of your um, laptops and other devices that you need to verify. Now you need to sign them all <coughs> and account for all of their combinations. Yeah, so you run a system update and it updates one little kernel module and now your measurement is varied. Does that mean that you were hacked or does that mean that you were just updated? So. People are now drowning in seeds of measurements. They do have some systems which will take Windows 8 Secure Boot, records and measures from the static root and stores all that in the TPM. And it can be configured to send those and kind of to test to an Active Directory. But now each computer has its own kind of fingerprint of unique measurements. And so the only way to really check that is to provision it, say, OK, it's good now, and I'm not going to touch it, which now incentivizes administrators to not update systems, which I think is much worse. Yeah. Well, um, there is something to be said for centralization, but it's not that it really scales well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so when you do trap to the VMM, uh, you get very similar to the hypervisor. You can see all the, the, the registers when they um, when the trap occurred. You can see you know the instruction pointer where, what kind was executing. 
um, an EPT violation, you can see was it a, a code execution problem or was it a data request? Um, and so you can get all that information and then you can change it as well if you want to. Um, we talked quite a bit about that. Um, system management mode uh, is also known as ring minus two. Uh, it's a, another execution environment. So you'll have your CPU, you have your, you know, this is say, um, you know, up here you have ring three, ring zero, and then uh, say you have over here is real mode, which there is no protections, uh, and then you have your VMM mode, and then you have down here SMM, which runs uh, in 32-bit Unreal mode by default, but you can get it into 64-bit or uh, protected mode. And it runs with hardware stealth protection. So um, operating systems can't influence it. It started back in the days of, say, DOS, where DOS was pretty small. It had to fit on a couple floppy disks. And each computer might have different code for turning lights on, thermal emergencies. And so they put that all in this kind of hidden area, which would just kind of interrupt whenever it needed to do that. It saves all the guest state or the OS state, and then uh, can come back to it. So there's been a few attacks out there um, starting in 2006 uh, when they first said that, oh, you know that there's actually no way to, it's not protected. Even though there are ways to protect it, it's not locked. There's a bit that you can sell to lock it, and that bit wasn't set by BIOS. So anyone could go in and just write code. After 2006, it got a little bit more tricky, but maybe every year or so, uh, someone finds a way to get back into it. But from our point of view, you can host a second uh, VMM that runs in there and virtualizes this uh, chipset code. So on a fully secure system, you'd have two hypervisors running, making sure that the guests are going well, and talking to each other to see, OK, that SMM is trying to attack the hypervisor over here. I'm just letting you know that. So um, you can do what you will with that. So are there any questions on the architecture or the, the kind of the pieces that all go into play. Uh, now I'm going to jump into a few couple interesting research papers that are out there, uh, and then we can kind of go from there. I just want to make sure that everyone feels reasonably OK with this. Good. OK. Oh, for a drink from a fire hose, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm all over the place. Uh, I mean, I, well, yeah. The area is a fire It is a fire it's, Yeah, it's. Uh, you know, when I was talking about hypervisors in class, uh, I was remembering how Zen work, and I was like, okay, you know, the hypervisor is in ring zero, and you put the operation system in ring one. Yep. And that's how it used to be. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, now you have uh, negative rings. And, um, uh, you know, what makes a ring, really, and what makes a ring useful is the uh, trapping configuration. Uh, no more, no less. Um, and uh, you know you, you can say that your code runs in this or that ring, but what that really means is that it's configured to trap on certain uh, classes of events. And of course, the configuration has grown enormously. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, um, the, the VM, VMCS, 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 yeah. VMCS uh, VTD, and a whole bunch of others. So this is really what makes those rings, or what makes them useful. Mm -hmm. uh, so back to how this is not perfect security and more about performance. Um, there was some work that came out at CCS not the, like a couple months ago or the year before that uh, where there are still side channels. Um, so your timing, obviously, if one computer is accessing a hard drive a lot, uh, you might have some problems with that because it might be accessing it on this part of the platter and then it has to seek all the way over to go back. And so you can notice some hardware latency. Uh, your shared processor cache, L3 cache, is shared across multi-core systems. Uh, and then your, you know, your I/O uh, and just general responsiveness. So they were able to map the cache as it went through to figure out what memory regions the other VM was accessing and what uh, actions it was performing. So they had one VM that was uh, decrypting information constantly using Elgamal and the libgcrypt, and then on another VM next to it. Uh, they had some code that was just walking the cache, and they were able to recover the private key across VMs, which is not a good thing um, in a lab setting. Uh, so keep that in mind as you go forth that 
you'll see a lot of security tools that say, oh, it uses virtualization. Therefore, it's good. But the same thing should be said about operating systems. Operating systems have a ton of protection. I mean, if you look at uh, what Google's doing with native client, you can download code that I wrote in assembly in your browser and have it run in the background and no one be the wiser because they're using some of those features of hardware isolation that most operating systems aren't. Um, and so it seems like it's the silver bullet that you're just putting in another layer saying, oh, well, this is now where we're going to pass the buck to. Um, but it's, there's still some issues. Yeah, we had a paper on uh, virtualization being overused and the standard academic paper on security uh, becoming pretty much, oh, we'll put a VM under it. And if there is not enough, then there goes another VM. <laughs> right? uh, and uh, literally, you would read that in the best conferences and you'd scratch your head, and, yeah, but who's going to manage all those operating systems? And uh, the paper that was submitted had pictures of overkill weapons uh, you know, a uh, 300 ton tank that w with three uh, you know, cannons, more like a ship than a tank. You know, a thousand ton tank, a tank as tall as a house, uh, and uh, all of those people things that people came up with uh, when they were dreaming up uh, modern warfare. And it didn't quite work out. The tall as a house tank just got stuck in a ditch. <laughs> uh, and um, you know, it's. We are, we, we'll see what this technology converges to. Yeah. But basically, if it's too complex, uh, it might get even built, but will it run? And where are the ditches? Yeah, so the, the only real benefit is, is that, A, you don't need to deal about backwards compatibility, so you're not you know, beholden to 40-year-old code. Uh, and then also, hopefully, the hardware can do more, so you have less code. That if you assume X number of bugs per lines of code or something like that, if you just have less lines of code in the last where the buck stops, um, then hopefully you'll you'll be somewhat more secure, but you still have lots of room to play. Um, so as he mentioned uh, with Jamie Butler, he saw that you know you actually have two instruction TLBs, or sorry, two TLBs, one for instruction and one for data. Uh, this is because when they lay it out in the silicon, um, they want to have the data TLB really close to the data fetch of log it, logic, and then the same thing uh, with the instruction fetch. Um, because I guess at that point, you know, those microns or whatever the, the scale is, nanometers, will actually slow down your processor. Uh, so that's interesting um, in that they show up as a logical entity on your computer. And I would say that almost never are they ever out of sync. Uh, and then um, Jamie Butler and Pax and a few others uh, came out with this rootkit, um, Shadow Walker, which split them up. So if you imagine you have some anti-rootkit software that scans your kernel that you wrote um, every hour or every minute, and it makes sure that it hasn't changed, this rootkit would go in. It would redirect the instruction TLB to point to bad code. And then uh, when your scanner came through, the data, when it was treating as data, when it was reading it in to measure it, it would point back to the original kernel, so everything was good. But if you actually jumped to that kernel module, you would go to bad code and run it. Um, so that was a rootkit that would hide other rootkits. Yeah, the Shadow Walker. Shadow what, Walker. what PAX did was even more interesting. Uh, it emulated the non-executable bit when the non-executable bit did not exist. So uh, it, would, uh, it messed with the data TLB so that if you uh, if you try to uh, um, uh, if you try to uh, you you marked the data pages as invalid in the instruction cache, or rather you would you would uh, just trap uh, uh, on those on the when you try to fetch uh, when you try to treat them as as as, as data, you would uh, uh, you would uh, succeed. So. Uh, um, uh, it was the supervisor bit, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. that was that was used there. Uh, so uh, that was before uh, Intel's support for the NX bit uh, was uh, universal across all platforms. So there you go, uh, a defensive yep. purpose and an offensive purpose, uh, similar mechanism. Yep, and then I swung it back to the defensive with uh, more measurement of running executables, um, in which so. Shadow Walker doesn't work on any core i-series, you know, Halem or newer, 
because they've actually added uh, a level 2 TLB, an STLB, which merges them all together. And standard paging is not granular enough to say this is execute only and this is data only. So it would just put them all together. Uh, and so if you tried to desynchronize it, it would just keep switching back and forth and your system would hang. Uh, or it would just pick whichever one was last. Um, so we had to make a couple modifications to that. So we used EPT uh, in an identity map on a thin hypervisor, uh, which didn't do any memory or uh, hardware abstraction. It just let the operating system run at basically native speeds. And it would transparently segregate code from data so that we had applications or, say, a kernel or a system management mode handler that as it starts running, it starts gathering state. So PE files and ELF files, for the most part, are really nice in that you have code sections or text sections, and then you have your data sections. And so system virginity verifier will actually go out and it'll just measure the code section as it's running in memory to make sure that no one's doing a code injection attack. System management mode uh, and some operating systems and some other applications don't have that benefit where the variables might be interleaved with the code. Uh, so when you have that, um, when you measure it and hash it again, then you're going to get a completely different hash. And you're not sure if that's just because someone's changed a variable or someone's rooted your box. Uh, so this would automatically segregate the code from the data. You could measure the code section ad nauseum. Um, and then you could detect code injection attacks almost instantly. We had less than 2% performance impact uh, measuring every one-tenth of a second. Uh, and this was a, a DARPA, DARPA, DARPA cyber fast track effort um, through much. Um, uh, I may have mentioned much, but he started out as uh, a hacker in the loft heavy industries, then led a series of companies as a uh, technical officer, and then ended up in the Department of Defense uh, as a senior DARPA director. And as he got more and more professional, his hair got shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. He started looking uh, like you guys, and then uh, now he's, well, he was, now he worked for Google, and he's growing a tan and a facial hair, but uh, um. yeah, that's, that's okay. I can match that. So uh, in uh, in uh, um, I was in D.C. for a conference uh, last year, and this really fancy car. I mean, a car is fancy if you don't know its make, right? Uh, certainly not a truck like mine. <laughs> My uh, uh, and uh, its number is uh, rootkit. Right, that one. Uh, I was given to understand that this was Jamie Butler. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, playing with playing with a translation look aside buffers. Yep. Is a good career. Yeah, exactly. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, are there any questions about this, or should I move on to the last? somewhat interesting research out there. When I email out the slides, I'll also email out all the references and papers. Um, the last one is called No Hype. Uh, I looked at a method just to remove the VMM from existence. So you start it up, and then uh, you allocate your resources directly at boot time. Uh, it's essentially like if you only know you're going to run these five applications, you give them each their memory and their access, and then you delete the they have the operating system delete itself and set up any um, trap flags just to terminate the application. Uh, so this does the same thing, but to virtual machines. So you can allocate your resources directly to each VM, maybe one core per VM. And then you each give one this much memory in EPT. And then you leave all interrupt trap, uh, sorry, any VM exit handlers just to terminate the VM. Uh, you have to make a small modification to the OS so that it doesn't crash itself when it does something like run the CPU ID instruction. Um, but it doesn't make it easier to hack. It's not like it, you don't rely on the operating system behaving. If anything, the operating system just denial of service itself. Uh, and I just thought that was just an interesting way to, to misuse existing technologies to gain an unexpected benefit. Um, probably this is the most secure hypervisor out there, and it does that by not existing. Um, and then just quickly, I think we're getting close to the end, uh, some random future work ideas. So uh, you guys are probably familiar with symmetric multiprocessing, SMP, um, multi-core, small multiprocessor systems. They treat all CPUs 
and all memory banks kind of as close enough that they'll access them all kind of without any preference. Uh, NUMA, non-uniform memory access, is for much bigger systems. So think things like BlueGene or some supercomputers, Unisys mainframes, where that processor might be in a different room. And so it's going to take a lot longer to read memory across a room or across you know, even just a really fast switch. Um, so you can set up different NUMA zones and say, all right, these CPUs will use this memory because it's closer. If they have to, maybe they'll go over and they'll ask, but they'll try not to. Uh, I think it'd be really interesting to write a VTX thin hypervisor that shows N systems that are just standard x86 uh, systems that are all networked together as one single system image NUMA system. So you could install vanilla Linux on, say, five computers at once. You'd set the zone so they wouldn't you know, go and try to access memory on the other systems that regularly because it would be much slower. Uh, and you could actually set multiple machines that look like one machine. Um, so this class, or people in this class, have shown that the Intel MMU is already turned complete. Uh, I think it would be interesting with VTX to show that you're capable of changing hardware, apparently, through software, and basically rewriting your architecture if you're not happy with it. Um, second one, uh, Elfback, again, uh, from Dartmouth. Uh, basically, it in increased OS introspection into the ELF for file format so that you don't throw away all that nice semantics you know when you're compiling code. It knows, OK, this function over here probably shouldn't be writing over this function over there. It knows that. But then a lot of that stuff just gets thrown away when you say, OK, here's a binary blob or when you have two libraries that were built by different people in different parts of the country. Uh, so very cool stuff. But Linux kernel modules are ELF files as well, except they're running in ring 0. So they actually have the ability, if say you get a small chunk of code that you can run maliciously, or a small uh, buffer overflow or ROP attack, you'd be able to kind of undo those protections uh, if you were running um, ELF back. So, Again, something a thin uh, hypervisor shim, which would have almost no impact on performance time, to kind of take that same idea, and then that way you could isolate kernel modules or even you know inside of a kernel module. Uh, so that would be um, something pretty cool, I thought. That would make a nice thesis. Uh, a beginning of that would make a nice project. Uh, by the way, Scott, wave. Scott Brooks, he is porting Elfback, which is an x86 thing, to ARM. Oh, very cool. Are using Trust Zone or just the. Sorry. Are you using Trust Zone or just the standard uh, like multiple privileges of ARM? Um, I'm not sure yet. No, okay. We're, um, we're in um, design stage. Okay, for cool. So this is actually uh, something that we wanted to talk to. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I think that would be pretty cool. Is it? Say your serial driver or your video card driver shouldn't be modifying your network stack. Uh, and so you'd be able to enforce policies like this. And all that really interesting like, automatic intent understanding stuff from Elfback could be kind of just plopped up to a higher privilege. So it could sit further down. And then you could even do the same thing with SMM. So if you had uh, multiple or uh, modules in your hypervisor, you could do the same thing. So. Final co-op. Hopefully, it didn't put you all to sleep and uh, provided enough overview so you at least feel comfortable what kind of stuff to search for. The Intel software uh, manual is really good. Um, I have a simple hypervisor that I built on top of for the MORE project. So it's um, a Windows 7 kernel driver. Uh, and then it just runs You know, very simple. It sets up a VMCS. You can set what you want to trap on. And then you can kind of write a handler. Uh, I can give that out, email that out, uh, or however you want me to distribute it if you want to play around with it. Um, so that's what I built on, on top of for more. But if anyone wants to do a research project with this, it certainly makes it much easier. It's like a couple hundred lines of code or a thousand lines of code, whereas Zen is 60,000 lines of code. Uh, and lastly, you know, happy to answer questions or uh, bounce ideas off of my contact information on the front, or you can get it um, from Sergey. So thank you. Yeah. We have, um, we have uh, uh, two more minutes. Okay. So maybe we can, um, you know, to to 
you know, put a cherry on top of the stick. Um, maybe we could, um, <laughs> maybe we could um, work through the um, uh, the uh, TLB trick. Okay. May I have the yeah? Uh, right. So the PAX trick was here is uh, a page table entry of um, um, of a page that you want to say is non-executable, right? And here is the TLB. Uh, this uh, PTE is visited uh, when the PTE is visited, when you actually translate the address. Uh, you don't want to walk the chain of all the uh, tables for that address again. If you can remember that address, the physical translation, the physical address in the TLB. So, you know, your virtual address to a physical address translation uh, is remembered after you into the TLB, after you walk the chain. Okay, so let's say you want to make this page non-executable, but you want to make the data um, uh, normally fetchable. So, you set a bit, in this case that was the uh, user supervisor bit, uh, to be invalid for the walk to this, uh, through this PT to trap. So uh, the first time you try to translate that virtual address, uh, whether you were doing data or uh, code, it would fail. And call the uh, page fault handler. The page fault handler will check is your PC, is your EIP instruction pointer in that page? If so, then you're trying to execute this page. So, NAC. Uh, you will not recover from such a page fault. If, however, you, your EIP was elsewhere, you, would, uh, you are uh, looking at this page for data, and you change that bit to valid, you let the, uh, you write that page, or read from that page, and you let the uh, next uh, virtual, uh, you, you let this virtual address translation uh, go through, you remember it in the TLB, in the DTLB, and then you immediately reset it back to, uh, you reset the PTE back to invalid. So the next time you come through uh, that path, say, on an instruction pointer, again, on, on uh, trying to fetch an instruction from here, you would again fail. But next time you ask for data, so long as that translation is still in the TLB, you will succeed. Because if it's in the TLB, it's valid, and you don't walk the table. So by making the valid mapping exist in DTLB for the page and not in ITLB, because uh, its lifting to ITLB was prevented by the page fault handler and the, the trap, and keeping the PTE in the memory always invalid, uh, you would emulate the NX bit. Uh, when I can do something like that, I consider my career uh, done. Right? This is very cool. Now explain that. All right. Um, now explain your, your turn on this. So this is uh, basically what you said, but from Shadow Walker's point of view. So you get your page fault. Uh, you see if this is your application. Your, if this is on a per application basis. I could uh, measure just one application. Uh, it would then go through, uh, and it would figure out. So otherwise, it would forward back to the operating system. Uh, if it was the target page that I was interested in. Uh, and then you can either say, is the ERP equal to your CR2? Um, which is the, the trapping address, though uh, Intel actually puts out an extra criteria that says a data or instruction, so you don't need to even do that check. Uh, then you could load the DTLB with data or load the ITLB with code. Um, you pop the error and then IRET. Um, so with the hypervisor, it's a little bit more uh, complicated. Um, this would be an EPT VM exit, so not an interrupt. Uh, we'll ignore the thrash part because that was actually just a bug. Um, it'll tell you if it's data or execution. That's something that shows up in the, uh, the VMCS. You can actually read that, whether it was a fault due to 
uh, essentially if the EIP is faulting or if your uh, read is faulting. Um, it would then go through. You can set your uh, EPT to point to the data page, and you set the permissions. So if it's you were trying to load the DTLB, you set it to read and write only, but not execute. You set the trap flag, and then you VM resume, or basically you send it control back to the guest. It will run one instruction, and then it will trap back to the hypervisor right here. Ignore thrash again. It'll clear the EPT permissions back to no permission, making basically marking it non-present. It'll clear the trap flag, and then VM resume. So that way, for that V TLB context of that guest, uh, you are setting that TLB for either the data or the instruction. The reason you have to set the trap flag and re-inject is because the hypervisor runs with a different VPID. Uh, so you actually you could set you can without that trap flag and re-injection, you're only going to desynchronize the TLB of the hypervisor, which is not what you want to do. So uh, that's kind of um, how that works. So you've made a security context label out of the VPID yep. and uh, the trapping bits. Yeah, so that's how you, uh, yeah, so exactly. So you set the VPID and then you'll go in and it will set the TLB to either execute or data um, based on those nice EPT, much more granular permissions. So you don't need the user supervisor bit because you have essentially a no execute, a no read, and no write um, bit, and then you can uh, re-inject and prime that way. So this is very interesting. The foundation of every policy is that uh, you label things that play different roles. You label uh, pieces of code semantically. You label pieces of data semantically. And uh, when a code wants to act on data, you check if the labels are compatible. If the thing that should be, that is acting now on this uh, data should be acting now on this data. Now. Uh, it used to uh, there used to be the so-called tagged architectures, which explicitly tagged pieces of memory and kept the tag throughout the CPU wherever those uh, pieces of data or pieces of code found their way within the uh, silicon. When we, when that when they met, you could enforce the policy. Uh, newer architectures do not have that. Uh, tagged architectures do not quite make it. However, these ideas keep resurfacing. Mm -hmm. uh, but you find the tag, you find the label spread between the different uh, pieces of hardware. But they form together a security context. And uh, they control, uh, ultimately, whether you have a trap on the operation and can stop this operation, examine it, and let it proceed if it's innocuous, or block it if, they, if, if it is not, if the labels do not match. But interesting, it, it's interesting how the tags are coming back, except they are spread mm -hmm. through several data structures. And the conceptual in the conceptual design, there's still that one uh, tag uh, with, um, with uh, appropriate trapping semantics. So uh, questions? Everyone is. Uh, uh, Everyone is uh, slowly digesting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, all right. In that case, let's uh, thank the speaker. Yeah. And this is the case of uh, um, Dr. Gray security research. You love. All right. Thank you. I'll be around for a little bit. If you guys have any questions, one on one or whatnot.